First of all, we just want to say thank you guys for joining the uh, Carolina's College of Health Sciences MLK Day virtual celebration. My name is Jeff Ross. I'm a manager for community engagement and social responsibility for HRM Health, and I am part of the diversity and inclusion faculty. We are so proud and delighted to be able to bring this program and this celebration to you today. So let me start by giving you a little bit of history on the MLK Day event. The Carolina's College of, of Health Sciences has a long-standing history of celebrating Martin Luther King Day in a meaningful way. The MLK celebration began in 2006 as a vision of a former teammate. Her name was George Goodwin. Her vision still lives today as this year marks the 15th commemoration having skipped last year's due to the college's relocation. This year's event is hosted by Carolina's Colleges of DNI Committee, and they will continue on with the same spirit of excellence as has always been uh, carried out in. The MLK Day celebration is traditionally an event that was held in person, and it served a delicious Southern style cuisine meal. That plated meal holds tremendous significance as that was, uh, or, or as it was Dr. Martin Luther King's last favorite meal. And so, it's interesting because as we will not be able to participate in that meal today, we know that this program will still hold the true significance that it actually has always brought. So as we continue today, again, my name is Jeff Ross and I will be the MC for today. We do apologize for a few little uh, glitches initially. And we also want you to know that we know this is gonna be a power packed celebration. I would not be able to do this alone. So we actually have two great people that are gonna help me today in moderating this great celebration. The first person that I would like to introduce, her name is Shannon Salone. She is a faculty member of the Radiologic Tech, uh, Technology Program. And she's also one of the DNI committee chairs. Shannon. Hello everyone and welcome. I am having difficulty getting my video working and I am working through that. Also, thank you, Shannon. I hope everyone have patience with us this morning. As we all know, there are some technical technical difficulties that happen sometimes, and so we do appreciate your patience. Our second um, moderator this morning is uh, going to be Ruthie Ma uh, Myhall. She's a director of development and alumni relations. Ruthie, good morning. Hi, everyone. Hello. Thank you for joining us. We so appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ruthie. And again, I'm just gonna reiterate, we thank you for your patience. We thank you for, um, for your understanding as we try to work through some of our uh, technical difficulties. Um, at this time, I would like to just go ahead and uh, introduce our keynote speaker for today. Some of, us, some of us are familiar with him, but I'm gonna introduce him to others. He's a consummate educator of medical students and surgical residents, skilled trauma surgeon, a clinical researcher. He's an author a clinical administrator, and a champion of diversity, equality, and inclusion in medicine. Dr. Jacobs' illustrious career consistently demonstrates his expertise and commitment to acute care, surgery, trauma care, organ donation, end of life care for surgical patients, and the prevention of interpersonal violence. His belief and political issues excuse me, his belief that today surgeons must begin to address the ethical, social, and political issues that so greatly affect the overall health and well-being of the patients for whom they provide care, and that the healthcare workforce must reflect the communities they serve, perfectly aligning with the vision and ideas espoused by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose memory and legacy we honor today. Join me in welcoming our great keynote speaker for today. Dr. David Jacobs. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you all hear me? I know we've been having some technical difficulties, so I want to be sure that uh, that everybody can hear me. So, yes, uh, great, 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 great. So, um, welcome everyone, and um, this is just a great day. It's a great day for I think our country. It's a great day for our healthcare system. I, I, I want to start by thanking the program uh, committee for asking me to speak. I, I'm not sure why they asked me to speak. Um, and I feel very um, um, 
inept, I guess, uh, following what we just heard uh, um, Dr. King's uh, I Have a Dream speech. So I am hoping no one is attending today believing that I have the oratorial skills of, um, of Dr. King, but I do have a message that I want to share with you. And so I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen uh, and hope that that works. Um, let's go over here. And we're going to go up to the beginning. And here we go. Um, all right, for some reason, we're not starting at the beginning. So I'm just going to flip through this very quickly and we'll get back to the beginning. As you see, we've got a lot of information that we're going to try to cover for you today. Um, I'm admitting people to the waiting room. Okay, so uh, the title of my comments today will be um, Injustice in Health, uh, Finding the Cure for Healthcare Inequalities. And, and you'll see in a second why we've chosen um, this. Um, this title. Um, again, thank you all so much for uh, allowing me the opportunity to share this information with you. Um, I, I, I always uh, like to start these uh, talks with uh, disclosures, and I really don't have any relevant financial disclosures. I am a surgeon, though, and not a historian or a sociologist, so bear with me. Um, uh, and if you all have a different interpretation of the information that I'm going to share, I'd love to hear that when we get to the uh, uh, to the uh, discussion at the end. Uh, discussions regarding race in America are always difficult, I think, particularly in these days and times that we find ourselves. Um, but much good can come from these difficult discussions. And so, I, again, I look forward to that discussion following my presentation. And although the presentation today will focus primarily on Black America, it is really no, in no way intended to diminish the other aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion that I think we really need to spend time thinking um, about and, uh, and acting on. Um, this is the quote that we took the title of the discussion uh, today from. It's a quote that many people have heard before, and we'll add some context to it in just a second. But the quote goes something like this, of all of, all of the forms of in inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman. This was made 55 years ago as he was um, addressing the medical health community. Uh, um, again, a, a very, very uh, poignant uh, reminder for those of us uh, today. Uh, here is the entire quote, though, um, and so that you have some context. We are concerned about the constant use of federal funds to support this most notorious expression of segregation. So he was referring to the use of segregated hospital facilities um, and uh, black and white hospitals at the, which was the, the, um, the rule of order at the time. And so that's what he was talking about when he was talking about the forms of inequality and, 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 and commenting on injustice and health being the most shocking and the inhuman. And then he goes ahead and emphasizes because this form of injustice often results in physical death. I see no alternative but to uh, take up direct action and creative nonviolence to raise the conscience of the nation. And so I hope at the end we'll have some opportunities to talk about what that direct action might look like as we move forward. So three big questions I want to try and cover for, cover. Uh, today. I'm going to be speaking about 50 minutes. Um, and so uh, I, I really will probably move through these slides very quickly. As you saw earlier, I have quite a few of them. Um, I try to move through those fairly quickly so that we can really have some, some opportunity for some discussion. So those three questions, where are we now? How did we get here? And probably most importantly, how do we move forward from where we are? And I think those three questions are important because as you look at this timeline, in order to get to action, I think we have to go through a couple of other steps. We have to acknowledge where we are and acknowledge why we are where we are. And without that acknowledgement and that understanding, I think it's difficult to move forward. Not only do we need to acknowledge that, but we need to accept that um, 
as a basis for moving forward. So that we're all on the same page. Uh, we all have a common understanding of why we have the health care disparities that we have now. And then we can move to action and then finally assess the results of our actions. So let's start a little bit by talking about disparities. And this slide sort of shows you the ultimate disparity, which is US life expectancy. And you can see that uh, uh, as you look at the life expectancies for black males, white males, black females, and white females, that that gap has narrowed over the last 30 to 40 years, which is, which is, uh, which is good news. And so in, in 1970, there was a 15 year gap in life expectancy. And that gap um, has narrowed significantly, but there still remains a gap between black men and white men. There's about a three, three and a half to four year gap with white men living longer. Uh, that gap's a little bit more narrow as we compare uh, black women with white women, but that gap should not exist. And hopefully in the next uh, few years, that gap will be gone entirely. But as of today, it does exist. Some other forms of, um, of uh, disparities uh, in terms of obesity. Uh, you can see high rates of adolescent obesity and childhood obesity in, uh, in, uh, in our black patients. Diabetes is 80% more likely to be diagnosed in black patients and uh, a, a two and a half times uh, increased likelihood of developing kidney disease as a result of diabetes. As you can see here, black folks are more likely to be hospitalized and have visual impairments as a result of their diabetes. So diabetes is more common and it's a much more aggressive dis disease uh, in black patients. Similarly, heart disease, high blood pressure, things affecting the circulatory system, much more common and much more likely to be poorly controlled uh, in the black community. Um, we'll talk a little bit more later about why this is, but there's some interesting theories that you should probably know about, one being the theory of toxic stress, and which basically says that, um, that racism in and of itself can directly lead to disease. Uh, and so uh, we, we understand that, uh, again, hypertension, high blood pressure is more common in Black patients, and some of the the underlying causes for that increase may well be the results of, of, of years and years of racism. Uh, and so again, unless we deal with those kinds of issues, we're going to continue to have the healthcare disparities that we have now. We also have healthcare disparities in cancer. You can see women are, black women are more likely to die of breast cancer than white women. Um, and disparities in colorectal cancer. I don't have it up here, but prostate cancer is also a significant disparity with black men dying at rates twice that of white men. Maternal and child health um, disparities exist with a, a, a much higher infant mortality rate in this country uh, for, for black infants, um, rivaling the infant mortality rate of some underdeveloped countries. So it's much technology and advancement as we have in our healthcare system today, we still have an infant mortality rate for black infants that's twice that of white infants. Uh, we don't necessarily like to talk about mental health, but there are disparities in mental health as well as this slide illustrates. So you may be thinking, well, maybe that's just because th these, these folks are older and whether it's toxic stress or whatever it might be, we certainly shouldn't be seeing these kinds of disparities in our young patients. And this was a recent study that was actually performed in Children's Hospital that showed that black children were three and a half times more likely to die within 30 days of surgery compared to white children. And these were, and this is not because they were less healthy, the study controlled for their level of previous health. Um, and, and so really goes to show that we have uh, um, widely disparate health outcomes between black patients and white patients in this country that involves all ages and all magnitudes of health. And so the question again becomes why. Some other uh, areas of healthcare disparity, this is obviously a picture of George Floyd and the outcry that occurred after his murder 
But I put this here because I want to just mention to you that I do believe we need to think about police associated killings in the same context that we think about other health disparities. And as this slide illustrates, black people are more likely to be killed, three times more likely to be killed by the police compared to white people. And so uh, I don't know that we oftentimes think of this as a health care disparity, but obviously being killed is um, an aspect of health that obviously there are disparities between different patient populations. And so I think it's healthy for us to think about this um, like we think about other health care disparities. I also uh, have a personal interest in, in, uh, in homicide rates and, and interpersonal violence, particularly among black males. Uh, and this slide nicely illustrates that the fact that I'm not sure you can see my pointer here, but when you look at firearm related death, the incidence of firearm related death in African American males is about um, 15 to 20 times higher than what it is for white males. Um, and so it is, uh, uh, it is an epidemic in the black community. And again, I think it is appropriate for us to think about this as a health care disparity. And then finally, um, as we wrap up this little uh, uh, portion talking about disparities, um, we, we can't leave that discussion without talking about COVID-19 uh, and the impact that it has had on marginalized communities uh, over the past uh, year um, or so. And so I would direct your attention to this third column here where it shows that black patients are 2.6 times more likely to contract COVID-19, 4.7 times more likely to be hospitalized as a result of it, and two times more likely to die. And that those differences extend not just in the black community, but the brown community as well. So in communities of color, um, COVID really sort of pulled the curtain back on these healthcare disparities uh, and, and, um, and brought significant focus to those. So we, we, we talked about death, but there are a number of other disparities that exist that really don't necessarily translate directly into death, but speak more directly to how we provide care to black patients in this country. And, and I won't go through all of these, um, uh, individually, but you can see from this slide that there are significant disparities in how we provide care. Lower rates of bypass surgery, lower rates of transplant surgery, lower rates of hemodialysis in patients, even after correcting for the severity of their disease. I put one here in, in yellow print because as some of you know, I'm a trauma surgeon and spent a, a fair amount of time in the emergency room. And so I was shocked to find out that patients who have long bone fractures in the emergency department receive, black patients receive less pain medication than white patients. And so it's not just about death, um, it, it is about how we provide care. And I think we have to, each of us has to ask ourselves, what are our biases? What's causing uh, these differences in how we provide care to different patient populations in this country? So. Hopefully I've given you a flavor for where we are. And, um, but again, if you hearken back to that timeline I showed you, it's important I think to figure out how we got here uh, so that we can then begin to move forward. Um, over the last 50 years, there's, there have been many theories about why healthcare disparities exist. Um, but for many years, this was the prevailing belief that black people had poor genes, they made poor choices, and therefore that resulted in poor health. Um, but I think that argument is, um, is short-sighted and really ignores the history of black people in this country. And so as we get ready to observe Black History Month, um, um, I think it's important to take a look uh, at, um, at the impact of many different um, uh, aspects of our history here um, and the impact that they've had on the health care community. And I'm speaking specifically about racism. We'll talk about what that is um, and, 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 um, and some of those impacts. Uh, but to just think about uh, poor choices and poor genes, I think uh, it really does limit our ability and limits our ability to think about what interventions might be helpful in erasing these, um, 
uh, these disparities. So I, I put the slide up here. It's uh, it's it's a busy slide, um, and I think that uh, it reminds us how complicated. Um, the the maintenance of health is in this country. So in that far right corner, you can see the health system. And so we all are part of the health system. And so there's certainly things that we can do within the health system uh, to promote health. But look at all of the other things that you see uh, to the left on that slide. And we call those the social determinants of health, things like economic stability, where you live, um, education, food, those kind of things all impact uh, an individual and a community's health. And so even if you provide pristine health care, state-of-the-art state health care, there are all of these social determinants that will impact how our patients do as a result of the health care that we provide. And so we can't provide health care in a vacuum. We have to consider the social determinants and, 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 and keep those things in mind as we work with patients uh, to come up with appropriate treatment strategies. And so looking at the slide, you can become easily very overwhelmed by the enormity of, of, of all the things that impact um, um, our health. Uh, but I, folk, I, I, uh, I encourage you not to be overwhelmed, uh, to, to bite off what you can, work in the areas that you, uh, that you have impact and that you have expertise, uh, because improvement in any of these areas will really result in significant improvement in our community's health. Just as an example, this is really not medically medical specifically, but I want to touch just briefly on this issue of redlining. And so as I showed you in that last slide, the health, the environment in which patients live and work and worship and, and socialize um, is an important component of what comprises their health. And, and so this issue of, of redlining, I, I think has really set the stage in this country um, for um, disparate outcomes in people of color. And so uh, hopefully you all are familiar with this concept of redlining. Um, I, I put this slide here because I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. No, I wasn't alive in 1940. You may think I was, but I, I'm not quite that old. Uh, but I grew up in uh, Cleveland, Ohio in a, uh, in a uh, part of Cleveland called East Cleveland, Cleveland Heights, um, which was a redlined area. And so for those of you who don't know what redlining is, redlining was a means of realtors classifying communities A, B, C, D, E, according to their desirability, how many black folks lived in those areas. And then uh, that translated into um, uh, people not being able to move into those areas because banks wouldn't provide loans for those areas. And so it, con it concentrated poverty, it concentrated people of color uh, in certain neighborhoods. And you can see an example here of one of those assessments where you can see it says class and occupation, laborers, nationality, 100% Negro. And so this would be given uh, a rating of D and uh, high rate uh, or high interest rate loans would prevail here. Lots of community turnover, no community stability. Um, and so you may be asking, well, why is he talking about things that happened back in 1940? And it's because those patterns, those residential patterns that were established in 1940 persist in Cleveland today. It's an article from 2018 that shows that those neighborhoods that were redlined in the 1930s and 1940s are the same ones now that are dealing with environmental stress, lead, um, a lot of factories there, sexual assault, poverty, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the, um, the legacy of, of, of redlining really does impact the health of the community 50, 60, 70 years later. And so again, we can't just look at healthcare, we have to look at all of the social determinants. And so hopefully I've convinced you at least so far that it's not just a, an issue of poor genes and poor choices, but that we really do need to look at our history and look um, at structural racism. So just a couple of of, um, of definitions before we move forward. Um, and that is that we think about race, um, obviously there's no racism without race. And so where did race come from? And, and, and I'm not, I, I think I'm probably preaching to the choir when I say this, but 
race is a societal construct. It's not a biologic construct, but it is um, a, a, a societal based definition that categorizes people on the basis of physical characteristics, skin color, hair type, et cetera, et cetera, and then carries that further to make generalizations about behavior, um, um, uh, intelligence, those kinds of things. Um, but it's not widely accepted that this classification was created for social and political reasons and really does not have a basis in genetic therapy or in biology. Um, and, and, in, and in fact, as you can see here on the bottom, there's probably more genetic and biologic heterogene heterogeneity within racial groups than between racial groups. So that's race. And then racism, I've got three different definitions for you here. Uh, and I'll just let you read those. But the one that I like is the one on the bottom uh, from the Anti-Defamation League, which basically says it's the marginalization and or oppression of people of color based upon a socially constructed racial hierarchy that privileges white people. So um, you can choose whichever of those you like, um, but I like this one because it emphasizes the social uh, um, definition or the social underpinnings of the definition of race and talks about this issue of hierarchy and privilege, which I think we always need to keep in mind. And then structural racism, a lot of talk about that nowadays. Uh, and again, this is a long drawn out definition, again, by the Anti-Defamation League. And I, I'm not sure I probably should not have given you the whole definition, but the first sentence really sort of sums it up. It's a combination of systems, institutions, and factors that advantage white people and for people of color cause widespread harm and disadvantages in access and in opportunity. And so as we think about healthcare disparities, we can, you can understand how structural racism has led to widespread harm and disadvantages in access and disadvantages in opportunities. And so I wanna shift focus here a little bit and talk about what the role of the healthcare community has been over the last 400 years, if you will, um, in contributing to where we find ourselves now with these healthcare disparities. And I think too often we find ourselves, those of us who work in healthcare, uh, we find ourselves believing that we're part of the solution and not necessarily part of the problem because we all went into this to help people and we have an altruistic outlook. We sort of tend to forget that perhaps maybe we are contributing to these disparities or certainly maybe some of our, our, our forefathers in healthcare uh, contributed to some of the disparities. And so what I'll focus on now, I could focus on a lot of the political things that have happened. I could focus on slavery, but I want to focus on what the role of the healthcare system, such as it is, the healthcare system has been over the years uh, in terms of establishing and even furthering um, the soil to provide the disparities that we're seeing now. And I'm going to do that by focusing on three different areas, one being medically based theories of, red, of, of racial inferiority, number two, medical experimentation on vulnerable patient populations, and then number three, segregation and the suppression of black medical providers. All these three things were things that were basically characteristics of the healthcare profession beginning back in the sort of uh, early to mid 1800s around uh, the, uh, the, the waning days of institutionalized enslavement. And so let's talk about the first of these, which is medically based theories of racial inferiority. And this comes as no surprise to you. Racism existed prior to slavery in, in 1619. And, um, you can go back to the early, early, early writings of the Romans and the Egyptians and find tinges of, of, uh, of, of racism and racial superiority and inferiority in their writings. Uh, but most of the people that you see listed here were from the European influence uh, and the fathers of microscopy, histology and biological classification uh, from various um, areas of Europe were, were very instrumental and influential in establishing um, and emphasizing uh, differences in races and, and the implications of those differences in races. 
uh, the last name you see there, Robley Dun Dungelson, however, did live in this country and has, and has been dubbed the father of American physiology and his textbook called Human Physiology was a major text in medical education in the mid 1800s. These are some illustrations from that text where he describes the three uh, racial phenotypes, the Caucasian variety, the Ethiopian variety, and the Mongolian variety. And, and again, keep in mind that we're talking about the early 1800s where there's not a lot of textbooks. We don't have Twitter, we don't have Facebook. And so the influential people here in many cases were the medical professionals. And so when people talked, when medical professionals talked, people listened. And so these kinds of theories were widely disseminated and widely believed to be based in fact, when in fact, there were no facts to um, support their allegations. Um, so racial inferiority was systematically taught in our medical schools. Uh, the, the University of Pennsylvania was a was a particularly prestigious school, an influential school, um, and uh, and many of these racial inferiority themes um, were, uh, came out of that school, which is where I happened to do my surgical internship. So um, uh, that influence there, um, but they but these physicians. Um, were spousing this as, as scientific fact, where in fact there was no basis for this. Uh, and they also felt that this was based upon research and personal experience. Um, you can see one of the top texts that was used at the University of Pennsylvania, Crania Americana, actually measured the circumference of the cranial vault of different phenotypes of people and then and then try to draw conclusions about brain capacity uh, and racial uh, inferiority and uh, and superiority based upon cranial measurements. Um, and so uh, also at this time there was an assumption that poor health was normal for for blacks. There was actually texts that were written describing various diseases that were peculiar. Uh, to the black and enslaved population. This is Samuel Cartwright, educated at the University of Pennsylvania, as you can see there on the right. And he wrote this um, treatise entitled Report on the Diseases and Physical Peculiarities of the Negro Race. Um, and this was presented at uh, a medical uh, convention in uh, New Orleans. Uh, and just as I got ready to say these were his slides, but obviously they didn't have slides. And these were taken from his book um, where you can see the various de de descriptions of various diseases. One of the more notorious is drepotoma drepotomania, which is seen in the, if you look in your right hand corner at the top, you can see this is a disease that causes Negroes to run away. Um, and, and so all of these, ah, yeah. theories, all of these theories were espoused and accepted, and, and accepted as medical fact because of the messenger. So this is the healthcare community. And, and, and so you might be saying, well, yeah, that's fine. That's, that's, that's 300 years ago, but we don't have those kind of myths anymore. We adhere to scientific dogma and research. Um, this study was uh, published in 2016 uh, and, and was troublesome to me because it is a study that looks at the beliefs of medical students and residents. So folks who are relatively medically sophisticated and the question was asked, are there differences in skin between black people and white people? Specifically, is, black, are, are, is the skin of black people thicker than the skin of white people? And we found that more, not we, but it was found that more than half of folks who responded to that believed that yes, there was a difference when in fact there is no difference. And so even today, and even a, amongst a group of sophisticated uh, uh, or medically sophisticated uh, 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 folks, there, these kinds of beliefs persist. Um, this study also uh, showed that there were, there were also beliefs that black patients didn't um, feel pain, mm. didn't didn't feel pain to the same extent that white patients felt pain. Oh, and that I, I, somebody's not muted. Somebody's going to need to mute. Thank you. Uh, and so that may get back to that issue where I told you that black patients may not be getting the same degree of pain medication in the emergency room. 
uh, as white patients when they sustain long bone fractures, because perhaps there are these beliefs that, that black patients don't um, experience pain uh, in the same manner that white patients do. So let's move on to talking about medical experimentation. This is not um, anything new. There's a lot of public media um, about this, but I take you back to, again, to the mid 1800s. J. Marion Sims was a gyne gynecologic surgeon, president of the AMA, and known as the father of American gynecology. Uh, he actually had a statue erected to him in Central Park of all places because of all the great things that he has done, uh, that he had done um, regarding uh, obstetric surgery. Uh, he perfected, he is uh, credited with perfecting the operation for repair of vesicle vaginal fistula. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's a, comp it's a complication of repeated childbirth. And so by this time, slavery had been outlawed. So the only way to keep the slave population numbers up was to uh, uh, in, uh, increase the number of slaves being born into, or, or children being born into slavery. And so black women were, were um, uh, impregnated at high rates, uh, had multiple children, and then after having multiple children would develop these vesicle vaginal fistulas, which would prevent them from working in the field and so on and so forth. So slave masters at this time had a vested interest in seeing that, in seeing something done about this vesicle vaginal fistula issue. And so this was an operation that was perfected by Marion Sims, uh, but he perfected it by operating on his slaves many times without anesthesia or addicting his slaves to um, um, pain medication to narcotics so that he could carry out these operations. Once this was discovered in the aftermath of his life, his statue was unceremoniously removed from Central Park. And uh, again, we're seeing a lot of statues removed once facts are being brought to, to light uh, about how their scientific advancements were made. A couple of other slides here about medical experimentation. I won't read these to you. You can read them as well for yourself, but just multiple, multiple um, uh, examples of medical advances, if you will, being uh, born on the backs of enslaved people, um, many times without um, appropriate anesthesia and certainly without what we would say today informed consent. So inoculations with smallpox being placed into an open pit oven. You can see these kind of things. Crawford Long, for those of you who are from Atlanta, has a hospital named after him. Um, and you can see some of the things that he was credited with doing with his enslaved people. More on this. Um, uh, again, more examples. Uh, slaves being um, vaccinated against uh, typhoid. Uh, again, what was termed successful experimentation. And then the last one here, uh, someone trying to uh, um, experiment on potential treatments for typhoid pneumonia by pouring five gallons of boiling water on the spinal cord of slaves. And so this obviously um, set the stage for uh, um, distrust. Uh, of in general of the African American community of the medical community. I think the most um, glaring and well known example of this is the Tuskegee study, which really got formally started in 1932. So went on for 40 years, where um, 400 black men uh, who had syphilis were intentionally not offered treatment known to be effective against syphilis. Um, and again, this was carried on for 40 years. They were led to believe that they were receiving treatment, but the goal of the study was to observe the natural history of the disease. As a result, many of these men died. Many of these men passed the disease on to their spouses and to their children. Um, and, and so um, the study was finally halted in 1972. And then it took the United States another 25 years to formally apologize. So here's Bill Clinton apologizing in 1997, uh, 25 years after the conclusion of the Tuskegee study. And so we think about the legacy of this study and the legacy of, of um, all of the other experiments that I mentioned. And there and have been so many others. Um, and so we we understand that there is a trust deficit in black patients as they look at the healthcare, as they look at us in the healthcare 
community uh, because um, of the belief that things don't change. Some things don't change. Other examples of uh, not so much experimentation, but certainly lack of informed consent. Uh, the eugenics movement, which really sort of took hold here in, in the state of North Carolina, which is forced st sterilization, um, brought on by the belief that we need to advance uh, the superior races and somehow suppress the inferior races. And so if we sterilize those races, then, um, then we will be advancing uh, humankind in general. And so thousands of women uh, lost their fertility um, as a result of these experiments or these practices that were done without the full knowledge and consent of the people uh, for whom these operations were done. And so what's the, what is the, what is the current day legacy of that? Um, and so as I think about this, I think about what our patients think, particularly our black patients think when the young doctor walks into the room, the young white doctor walks into the room, he looks like he's 13 or 14 years old. And I can imagine people thinking, is this guy adequately trained? Is this another situation where I'm being experimented on? And you can see the the quote from Ben Franklin, beware the young doctor and the old barber. But I really do wonder sometimes when I'm making rounds with some of my residents, what um, these patients are thinking when they see these very, very, very young patients and wondering whether these folks are adequately trained, do they know what they're doing, or am I being used as a guinea pig? Um, and I, I, I think back to my surgical training when I was allowed to operate independently before I finished my training. I was allowed to operate independently on indigent patients or non-insured patients as a, as a means of my learning. And so uh, in some ways, um, I view that as experimentation. Is it necessary? It's necessary to gain autonomy. It's necessary to gain experience. But are we subjecting patient populations to different standards of care by not providing the supervision that we should really be providing? And so again, you can say, well, we're not doing experimentation anymore. And uh, Tuskegee was 50 years ago, 60, 70 years ago. But I, I wonder whether there are vestiges of that practice that we really need to re-examine today. So finally, let's talk about segregation and suppression of black medical um, providers. Um, and I think everybody's familiar with um, the Jim Crow era. But I think when we think about Jim Crow, we think about um, separate but equal. Uh, and, um, but, and we think about that in terms of transportation. So you had to sit on a different part of the bus or a different part of the train. Or, you, or in the education era where, you, where we had separate schools. But I don't think we always oftentimes think of um, how Jim Crow uh, was um, or, or infiltrated medicine um, as well. Um, just a little mention here of the lynchings that occurred um, in the Jim Crow era. Uh, again, some of you may not believe that we should be talking about lynching when we're talking about healthcare, but uh, Certainly, uh, the death, uh, the death of thousands of, uh, of black people um, at the hands of white vigilantes, uh, I think, can certainly be viewed through a healthcare lens. So, looking a little bit more closely at uh, Jim Crow in American healthcare, you can see that many, many states had ordinances that prevented black patients from being in the same hospital, in the same hospital room, being cared for by the same person as white patients. And so this clearly had some impact upon the quality of health care that black patients received. And you can see this is not middle 1800s, we're talking 1915, we're talking 1935, um, where, uh, where these ordinances have been um, enacted, leading to uh, a two-class system. Um, and again, just a nod to the lynchings. For those of you who have not been to the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, um, I would certainly recommend that. This is um, the, uh, the uh, monument, if you will, to the lynchings that occurred in Mecklenburg County. And so if you go, you'll see every county uh, where a lynching occurred and the names of those who were lynched. And so just very, very, very powerful. Um, uh, experience that I would recommend. 
as a result of um, uh, the Jim Crow impact on American health care, uh, the development of black hospitals and and um, and black health care providers was necessary. No one else would take care of black patients. Um, and so you can see uh, that even in the as early as recently as the 1920s, uh, we have 14 black medical schools across the country that were responsible for developing not just physicians, but nurses and other forms of health care providers. And so this was sort of the heyday of black health um, as black folks were looking after black folks. Around that same period of time, maybe a little bit later, um, we have the Hill-Burton Act. And, and this, this is important. We'll come back to this in a second. But the Hill-Burton Act was enacted in the aftermath of World War II. And so as you, as you probably know, a lot of domestic industry during World War II was diverted towards the war effort. Uh, and so um, hospitals and, and were decimated. Um, doctors were uh, were doctors and nurses were were um, uh, relocated to the to the uh, front uh, to fight. Um, and so we really did not invest in the healthcare infrastructure during those during those years. And so right after World War II, this money was allocated to really rebuild the healthcare infrastructure for the country. You can see $13 billion was provided, responsible for 30% of new, all new hospital construction between 1949 and 1962. Um, this was, it's called the Hill-Burton Act because there are two senators, one from the North and one from the South. And one of the compromises that came about as a result of this was, it would be okay to continue to discriminate, to continue to have a two-class system of health care as long as there were, quote, equitable provision on the basis of need for facilities and services of like quality for each such group. So this is federally funded, uh, federally sanctioned segregation, two-class system in health care uh, that arose as part of this Hilburton Act. And those funds were used to build 104 facilities that practiced racial exclusion and over 7,000 quote unquote non-discriminatory facilities which segregated patients either by room or by floor. Um, uh, and so um, uh, again, just another example where the healthcare system um, had the opportunity, I guess, um, to uh, improve the lot of all of its citizens and made the decision to go in a different direction. Now you could argue, well, that was just that was just the times. That was what was going on in the in the 40s and in the 50s. And so we can't expect the healthcare community to um, to be held to a higher standard. Um, and again, that gets to the to the initial question I asked: Is we think of ourselves as being held to a higher standard, but I think history tells um, a different story. I also think that future generations will look to us as healthcare providers and say, ask the same question. Did we adhere to the standards of our time? Did we go along with the standards of our time? Or did we say, this is not appropriate. We need to adhere to a higher standard. So I, I think we can ask that question to ourselves. So thinking about the Hill-Burton Act, this hospital who you may recognize, this is the Charlotte Memorial Hospital, the forerunner to uh, Atrium Health Medical Center um, was a recipient of those Hill-Burton funds and practiced, as many hospitals did during that period of time, segregation. You can see that Black patients were only allowed in the emergency department. Uh, this is around 1940. And they were only allowed in the emergency department if the staff believed that they wouldn't survive long enough to get transferred over to the Black hospital, which was Good Samaritan. Um, and you can see the amount of Hill-Burton funding two different occasions of Hill-Burton funding being used to expand uh, Charlotte Memorial Hospital. So things were no different as you might expect. Here is Good Sam, which was built in 1891. Certainly doesn't have the same physical uh, 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 appearance and uh, facilities as did the Charlotte Memorial Hospital. Ultimately, finally demolished in 1994. And this is uh, some of you who've been to the Panthers games have seen this plaque. So Panther Stadium now sits where Good Samaritan Hospital sat. So if you get the opportunity to go and look at this plaque uh, now, uh, hopefully you'll have some context to understand why that why the establishment of Good Samaritan was necessary. Um, 
Another Carolina connection, if you will, is the Moses Cone Hospital, which is a hospital that I believe is still at least administered by Atrium, although some of that may have changed recently. This is a, um, a, a sentinel case in the history of healthcare discrimination in this country. And it occurred again, right in our backyard in Greensboro, where a, a dentist in uh, Greensboro uh, tried to admit a black patient to two hospitals two different hospitals, both of which had, had received Hilburton funding. Uh, they were denied um, and the doctors were uh, denied uh, privileges um, to see patients uh, at those hospitals. And so two different aspects of segregation, if you will. Uh, the doctors ultimately, uh, that was Dr. Simpkins, uh, ultimately brought suit um, and um, this finally worked its way up actually to the uh, uh, fourth district or fourth circuit court of appeals that uh, essentially held that separate is not equal uh, and that we can't use federal funds to practice discrimination. And this case is widely recognized as bringing an end to segregation uh, in hospital facilities across the country. And you can see there's a plaque here again, another plaque. Uh, if you go to Greensboro, you'll see that um, this, this plaque that says landmark federal court of appeals decision in 1963 that led to racial integration of hospitals across the country. And this is Mr. Simpkins' uh, son. Uh, and so the long and winding road to health equity, we talked about the Hilburton Act and how it was flawed. The Civil Rights Act uh, followed in 1964, um, but was really not all that successful in integrating healthcare facilities and it really took, took um, the Social Security Act in 65 and 66, because now you're talking about withholding funds from hospitals. And if hospitals understand one thing, it's money. And so when the threats came that you're not gonna get paid, then the walls of segregation came down. Uh, and so this was the, the, the context in which Dr. King was remarking when he said, we are concerned about the constant use of federal funds to support this most notorious expression of segregation. So this is right before um, uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, was passed. Uh, and so he says of all the forms of, in, of, of inequality and justice and health is the most shocking, uh, et cetera. I, I now call your attention to his last part of his statement, which is I see no alternative to direct action creative nonviolence to raise the conscience of the nation. And so um, just a few words about the other aspect of segregation and how that impacted black health. And that was a, the, the segregation and suppression of black health care providers. And you can see uh, signs of picketing. This was a, um, an, uh, an AMA meeting. Um, and AMA, as you'll hear, had a policy of strict segregation that they maintained until 1968, even though they were established back in the late, I'm sorry, in the middle 1850s or so. So for more than 100 years, they had multiple, multiple opportunities to quote unquote, get it right, um, but uh, stayed with the policies of their days and their times uh, and excluded black physicians. This resulted in the establishment of black medical societies, the first one being in Washington, D.C. in 1884, and then ultimately the establishment of the National Medical Association, which exists today, and that was established in 1895. So here's some of the track record of the AMA. You can see um, that uh, there is almost no mention of civil rights in any AMA records. And mo again, multiple opportunities to do the right thing. There was actually an AMA meeting in uh, Fulton County in Atlanta where uh, black physicians were arrested for eating at the lunch counter and the AMA was silent on that. Um, of course, they weren't AMA members because they'd been denied um, um, membership to the AMA, uh, but the AMA was, was quiet. We heard a lot about uh, the Selma March um, in the death, in the aftermath of the death of John Lewis uh, late last year. And um, there, were, uh, there was a white physician who was there and wrote an article that he submitted to the Journal of the American Medical Association describing the physical injuries and the violence that occurred in the aftermath of that Selma or during the Selma March, submitted it to uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association. They initially accepted the paper and then a couple of weeks later, 
said, uh, we can't publish this, it's too controversial. Um, and so again, probably nothing that would get your attention if you were living in those days and times. They were simply uh, abiding by the, by the norms of the time. Uh, but I hasten to remind all of us, are we abiding by the norms of our time? So the AMA is getting more and more powerful. Uh, they control state medical societies, but they also control licensing. They control training. So if you want an internship, you got to go through the AMA. And so this had a devastating effect upon the ability of black um, nurses and physicians to get training. Um, and so the majority of, of, of black physicians were trained in these black medical schools uh, and, the, and, and in these black hospitals. And the AMA wasn't alone. You can see there's a number of of, uh, of health associations and hospital associations that had similar, similar uh, approaches and similar stances. The Flexner Report, many of you have heard about, we talked about the black hospitals and the black medical schools, but the Flexner Report was actually sponsored by the AMA. Uh, and so the AMA was, was working overtly behind the scenes. Um, and uh, the Flexner Report, um, Abraham Flexner went around the country looking and surveying all the medical schools in the country and ultimately um, recommended that only two of the seven existing medical school, black medical schools, Harry and Howard, be allowed to remain open and that they should be preserved and train their students to serve their people humbly as sanitary. And so he believed that they should only stay open, but not to train full-fledged physicians, but to train sanitarians so that they could serve their own people. And this, again, had a profound impact upon the ability of Black uh, healthcare folks to find opportunities to be trained. It's another slide about the opportunities that, they, that the AMA had as far as North Carolina is concerned. Uh, Old North State Medical Society is the NMA branch uh, for North Carolina. They requested in 1952 to join the AMA. They were denied in 1963, as recently 1963. So this happened probably 30 to 40 times. I've only listed three here, but many attempts to change discriminatory practices were rebuffed by the AMA. AMA finally made an apology in 2008, uh, fo focusing on four different areas. Uh, they admitted that um, in the years following the Civil War, they declined to embrace a policy of non-discrimination and excluded the local medical societies. They admitted that between 1870 and 1960, they uh, failed to take action against uh, local medical societies who excluded um, folks on the basis of race. Um, and um, in the early decades of the, of the, um, of the 20th century, um, they listed physicians, uh, they would list a COL after their name, which was a, um, an indication of being colored. Um, and as you can imagine, that had a devastating effect when people would search this directory uh, to find a physician, they would see those three names, CO, those three letters COL, and, um, and that would have a chilling effect upon their ability to generate a living, to see, to see patients, to, be, to continue to be trained. And then in the late 1950s, silent about the Civil Rights Act and not supporting uh, 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 and not opposing uh, the NMA stance on the, Ill the illegality of the Hill-Burton Act. So multiple opportunities, they had to do the right thing and, and, um, uh, and they did not do that until 1968. And so hopefully I've convinced you that structural racism has had an impact upon um, uh, the development, the promulgation of uh, healthcare disparities in this country. And hopefully I've disabused you of the notion that uh, it's simply an issue of poor genes and poor choices that have led to these healthcare disparities. And so where do we go from here, from poor genes and poor choices? I would suggest to you, um, maybe, maybe uh, an oversimplification that uh, we're now dealing with in an era of misunderstanding and mistrust. And I think we need to use very, very, very broad definitions of both of those. But certainly our healthcare system has been built on misunderstandings and promulgations of racist theories that have no basis in scientific fact, uh, misunderstandings of the things that have generated lack of trust uh, within the African American community of the healthcare system, um, and a misunderstanding of the perception of the African American community 
of the healthcare system. And so I think unless we um, focus on these areas of misunderstanding and the areas of mistrust, we will continue to have um, healthcare disparities. And so how do we move forward? We go back to this slide where we talk about acknowledgement and acceptance. And so uh, I went through all this history to hopefully help us understand how we got to where we are and acknowledge the role that the healthcare system has played in the development of a two-class system and in the um, uh, uh, creation of the healthcare disparities that we witness today. I think once we acknowledge that and accept that, then we can begin to move forward. But I think until we do, and we embrace the old theories of poor genes and poor decisions, it, it, that puts the onus of, of maintaining health back on the patient as opposed to looking at the system and looking at ourselves as providers and saying, what can we do? So in order to move to action, we really do need to move through acknowledgement and move through acceptance. So I return to this quote, maybe for the last time, and have put in yellow down here that Dr. King said he sees no alternative other than direct action and creative nonviolence. And so I asked the question today, what does direct action look like in 2021? I return to the slide that is easily overwhelming for all of us. Where can we make an impact in, in any of these areas that I think will help um, reduce the disparities that we're witnessing in healthcare uh, today? Um, we, uh, let's focus on the healthcare system and focus on building health and trust. And I would suggest that these three areas are areas that are probably, um, um, uh, oh, sorry, these six areas are areas that I think we can focus on. So improving access to healthcare, improving uh, diversity within the healthcare workforce, increasing the, worst, the, 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 the cultural competence of the workforce, using data to drive our interventions, developing task force, focusing on healthcare disparities, and then finally addressing the social determinants of health. So as we try to improve access to healthcare, we need to look at the drivers of disparity in our communities, whatever they may be. Do we have healthcare facilities located in close proximity to these communities? I think the COVID ep epidemic and our testing early on showed that we were not testing in areas of high COVID, preval of high COVID prevalence. And, Fortunately, we recognized that shortfall and corrected that. Are we initiating similar kinds of errors when we're looking at how we're vaccinating our patient population? So I would encourage us to think about that. So look at the data and then develop strategies that, that address those disparities, whether it's the development of community health centers, mobile units, more novel kinds of ways of making sure that the community can access the healthcare system when it needs to do that. Telehealth has become a very big thing now. Maybe that's a tool we can use that will allow greater access. Healthcare workers, uh, navigators, um, medical homes, all these things may be helpful, I think, in improving access. What about workforce diversity? Well, we know that um, when there's concordance between the provider and the patient, that we have better outcomes. Um, minority medical students, want to work in these um, underserved areas um, and minority patients tend to prefer minority physicians. So there's all kinds of arguments on both sides of the coin there, but I would suggest that, uh, that, that it is something that we need to, we need to work on developing a, a healthcare workforce that reflects the patient population that we serve. This is a study done in Oakland that basically showed that when black patients had a black provider, that they had a significant reduction in cardiovascular disease and that black patients were more likely to uh, follow through on screening for diabetes, get their flu shots. And this may have significant impact now as we struggle with how we're going to vaccinate our communities of color. Cultural competence is important. We have to understand where we came from. We have to understand where our patients are coming from, what their uh, impression of the healthcare community is, what their fears are, what their levels of of trust are, and until we do that and, 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 and understand that and accept that, it's going to be difficult for us to provide competent care. 
So the, the goals of, of cultural competence are to reveal our own biases, which we've talked about, to emphasize the historical roots of racism that exist in the medical system and maybe in our own communities, dispel the false beliefs about race-based physiologic differences, uh, and then improve understanding about how different cultures respond to different illnesses. Um, uh, and, and so this is important work that we all must undertake. We need to use d data when I say real data. So we need to collect data on race, ethnicity, and language so that we understand how patients view themselves as opposed to looking at somebody and saying, oh, you, you look black, you look Hispanic, you look X, Y, and Z, asking them, finding out what they believe, how they view themselves, and then look at how that data informs us as to where their opportunities are for us to improve the overall healthcare system. That data collection should be developed in consultation with the communities we serve so that we're sure we're collecting the appropriate data and we're sure that they know that we're collecting this data and why we're collecting the data. And then use the data to develop targeted interventions and best practices. We need to conduct research, um, but probably most importantly, we need to collaborate with other organizations, including community-based organizations who are going to be the recipients of this. There's nothing worse than us telling people what they need to do. They need to be at the table and working with us to try and eliminate these disparities. So how do we sustain this? We need leadership from our administrators and our clinicians um, and the, and the, 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 uh, the anti-bias training, the cultural sensitivity needs to be ongoing. It can't be one stop and then not revisit it. It has to be continuous and woven into the fabric of our education and our quality programs within the hospital. And so in summing up here, we're trying to get to health equity. We talked a little bit about access. We talked a lot about racism here and the social determinants of health and finally workforce diversity. So these are all areas that we can work on to try and get to where we want to go if we want to realize um, and address Dr. King's concern uh, about injustice in health. And so um, I thank you for your attention. I ran a little long, I apologize, but I really look forward uh, to, to your questions and to your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs, for your presentation. It was very insightful and it was very um, full. We are very richly um, we're very overwhelmed by what you presented. I do want to go into the question and answer session. Um, I think you did an outstanding job, but we do have some questions. We had a lot of participants to begin to the conversation. We had Rick Botello. I think that's how he says his name. Um, his comment was pursuing health equity is an ethical and political challenge. What healing questions would MLK ask Biden to unite the divided state of America, redress isms, and reduce inequities? And he, he has a, a second part of that question as well, but if you could answer that first question, do you want me to restate it? No, I'd prefer to skip it actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it's an incredible question, but so so as I understand it, the question is, what advice would Dr. King provide to 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 uh, President Elect Biden? Um, and um, if anything, we live in a more divided country than we lived in then, if that's if if that can be believed. Um, but I think um, the obstacles that, doc, that that Joe Biden faces now are to try and somehow unite the country and, and help us all recognize that we're in this together. And I think the, the message from the healthcare perspective is the same. We can't say that we, I, I hear people all the time saying we have the best healthcare system in, in the world. Um, we can't have the best healthcare system in the world as long as we have disparate outcomes. Um, for certain populations. And so we all need to view ourselves as being in the same boat uh, and that when we improve the care of one patient population, we improve the health care of the entire country. There are financial arguments for improving the, the um, entire health care of the entire population. And so I would say the message would be, we're in this together. We can't look at 
making improvements in healthcare in one sector, one, one specific patient population. We need to figure out ways to spread that across all of our citizens um, um, if, if we are going to move forward together. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs. We have other questions. One is from Melissa Venable. She asks, how do we begin to make the changes and educate patients through the school systems? And I think we've, we've talked off, off record about this a little bit and you've got, you had some wonderful insight about the education system. She also continues to say, can we find a way to connect Atrium Health with the schools? Atrium Health does a good job with connecting with our athletes and providing sports physicals. Maybe we can provide some information to our parents who might need help in these areas. Yeah, so another great question, another great comment. So, so I, I think what she's getting at is um, what, what responsibility does Atrium Health have uh, as in terms of building the pipeline? Um, and I didn't mention it specifically. I put it on one of my slides, but I didn't mention it specifically because I was running out of time here. But we all have a responsibility to build that pipeline. And when I say build the pipeline, it is who are going to be the medical care providers in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years? beyond that. Um, are they going to look like the population that they serve? Right now, 5% of physicians in this country are African American compared to a overall population of about 13%. And so we are underrepresented uh, as African Americans in the healthcare community. We have to, at an early stage, begin to direct students into healthcare professions, not just not just being doctors. There's multiple opportunities to participate in this and improve the overall care, uh, but we have to start early. We have to get our kids interested in STEM. We have to get our kids exposed to um, uh, the healthcare opportunities that exist uh, and do that at an early age. And so, yes, we do have to uh, avail ourselves of opportunities working through organizations like the Black Church, mentoring organizations um, to get these young folks to see themselves um, as potential um, health care workers. If they don't see people who look like them that are already in the field, they'll never believe that they can possibly do it. Um, and so that requires intentionality. We have to go out and say, I am going to do X, Y, and Z with this school. And again, you can become overwhelmed with this. You can look at this and say, this is such a big problem. We'll never, ever be able to make a dent in this. Find your child's elementary school or talk to your, your child's elementary school teacher or your principal and say, we want to develop a partnership where we now we, we're in COVID now, so we can't bring a bunch of kids into the, into the hospital, but we can, there are things we can do through, through um, uh, web-based um, opportunities that will um, encourage and open up people's eyes to the possibilities. So yes, we should be doing those things. And I think we are doing those things. Thank you. Jeff Ross asks, can you discuss ways in which health and wealth disparities parallel? Uh, yeah, uh, it, it's hard to separate the two. You can't have, um, unfortunately, we live in a country right now where, you, where, where your health uh, frequently is dependent upon your wealth. Um, patients who are insured um, have better health outcomes um, and live longer. And so we have a two, three, four class healthcare system. And the question is, I think for us, is, do we want to live in a system where folks who don't have money don't have health care. And so is health care right? Is health care a privilege? We can talk about this forever and ever and ever. This is why the Affordable Care Act was so important uh, or some means of making sure that everybody has um, access to quality health care. And so if you're, if you're not healthy, you can't work. If you can't work, you can't buy a house. If you can't buy a house, you can't accumulate wealth buying a house is the most important way that we accumulate wealth as Americans. And so whether it's the health to wealth paradigm or the wealth to health paradigm, the two are, as they say, inextricably linked. I think there is a, a part two to that question, Dr. Jacobs, just looking and hearing your answer. 
I want to pose this question. How does racial inequality pose a public health threat to our society? Sometimes there's a stratification of those who are disadvantaged, but how does that pose a health threat to all of us? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think the simplest way to answer that question is to look at the, at, at the language that everybody speaks, and that's the, the language of green. And so if we are, uh, we need to shift how we provide health in this health care in this country to one of not, not um, and our, our, uh, our atrium motto sort of emphasizes this, we need to, to, to focus more on prevention and maintaining health uh, as opposed to trying to fix things once they're damaged and, are, and, and broken. Uh, it's much better for the population and it's much better for health care financing. And so if we can shift how we look at things to health promotion, um, then we spend less money. We have more money to spend on other needed things within the, when we spend 20, 25% of our annual budget in this country goes to healthcare. We can be so much more efficient and so much more effective at dealing with all the other issues that we have as a society, if we could really shift. And so, as I've said here, if you've got a segment of your patient population that's not healthy, and you're spending lots more money trying to restore health in that patient population, then that drags down the overall health, increases the overall costs, um, and and does detriment to the entire healthcare system and the entire country. Um, and so I'm not sure I answered your question, but um, but certainly having a, a, a patient population that is not healthy does impact the overall health of the entire country. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs. I have another question from Sarah Robbins. She asks, why does Atrium Health continue to differentiate GFR, glomerular filtration rate by race, African-American versus non, when this directly impacts a patient's ability to get on the transplant list? Next question. <laughs> So I can't, I cannot speak for Atrium Health. I do not make the decisions that de 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 determine, um, but the questioner is, is asking a very, very um, sophisticated question that is on the cutting edge right now. People are considering whether uh, having different, and this, it's not just this particular issue, but there are many race-based uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, treatment tests and strategies um, that may actually disadvantage certain patient populations. Um, and, and so some of this is based on science and theory and some of it is not. Um, and so my, my best guess to answering this question is, is that um, Atrium Health, like many other healthcare institutions are actively considering whether we should continue to use that, um, but we need more information unfortunately. And so you have a choice. Do you get rid of what we're doing now while you're waiting for that information or you continue doing what we're doing and waiting for the information? But that's way above my pay grade at this point. <laughs> you alluded to this in your, and this is probably something that will be helpful for that question. You alluded to this in your presentation. Um, but here is the question that I pose. There is a, usually a failure to address the structural oppression that contributes to outcomes as it relates to African American and, and the community as such. How can health providers be better about identifying the barriers that prevent access? Well, I think, you know, through, um, through opportunities like this, um, I think that we always have to be educating ourselves. I think we're fortunate in this day and time now um, because of what COVID has um, has um, revealed when we pull back the curtain because of the death of George Floyd. There is so much more out there written about this. Uh, and I think that we have to challenge the notions that we were given in our education. This whole notion of bad genes, bad decisions, bad health, I think is, is prevalent, is rampant in our community. Um, uh, and so uh, I think we, we need to, to educate ourselves, but I think we, we as, as African-American providers need to take every opportunity we can 
to be sure that we set the context. Um, we need to work with our media partners. We need to work with our education providers at all levels to be sure that whenever information goes out, it go, it's historically correct, number one, but it has context. Um, and I will tell you, just from the kind of work that I do, I'm interested, in, uh, I'm a trauma surgeon, I'm interested in violence prevention. You turn on the news at 11 o'clock at night, and the first thing you hear about is who got shot. But do you ever hear about the context? And I'm not, I'm not telling you that there needs to, we need to follow each gunshot wound story with, well, it was okay that he got shot because of X, Y, and Z. That's providing excuses. But we need to understand the cultural, the economic consequences that have led to there being a 15 times higher mortality rate for young black men with gunshot wounds. We need to understand that as opposed to thinking, well, he was probably somewhere he shouldn't have been and therefore that's why he got shot. We need to develop a more sophisticated, a more nuanced, a more introspective view of why we have the health problems we have, why we have the societal problems we have. But we, I can't make somebody do that. That's got to be something that's, that comes from within that says, I need to understand this better. I'm tired. I'm frustrated with taking care of this patient population the same way we've been taking care of them for the last 50 years. Let me see if we can do something differently. That's got to come from within. It can't come from without. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs. We are at time. I just want to read a couple of comments, though. Fernando Little says, Dr. Jacobs is a wealth of knowledge and an incredible asset to Atrium Health. Um, there is also a comment from Melissa Venable. She says, thank you so very much, Dr. Jacobs and the Carolinas College team. So necessary. Um, there is comment from, let's see, very awesome presentation from Zena. Um, the last question we probably have. I need to you to, I need you to read the, the bad ones. I need, you to read, I need you to read the ones that say, don't ever have this guy come back again, please. There are not any bad ones. <laughs> um, fantastic presentation for MLK Day. We just really do thank you for gracing us with your presence. And we are so full with the rich knowledge that you have, um, have, have basically transposed to us. So thank you so much. I am going to turn it over to Jeff Ross to close out our presentation for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, Dr. Jacobs, I, I, I could not, and, I, and excuse me, Dr. Lewis, I probably will go off script just a little bit, but I have to say and just hop out of this wonderful MLK celebration to go into church a little bit and say, did not our hearts burn as you walked us through this presentation? It was amazing. It was riveting. And I was going back and forth with my colleagues in the comments. This was rich information. And it has already inspired people to what we really wanted to happen today was to try to figure out how we can take action. This is a lot of information for any of us to try to digest at one time. But I love what you said. Each one of us has an opportunity to take this by the helm and run with it. And so what I, I was going to kind of dismiss or I was going to kind of leave us with the Martin Luther King thought, but I think Dr. Jacobs, you segued this perfectly. I firmly believe that in the hearts of most people, we want to lift everyone up. And this kind of task sometimes can, it can be cumbersome because it seems to be so big and so vast. And how could we wrap our arms around the inequities in healthcare, the disparities in healthcare? And I submit to each and every one of us, I think Dr. Jacob said it best. It's wherever you have been raised in your consciousness, you get in and you fit in. I do know that if there's misunderstanding, that can be taken care of by one conversation at a time. If there's mistrust, that's sitting down and just getting to know people and having coffee with them. What I also know is as a healthcare system, I support the fact that we have embraced the area of disparities and choose to dive in all hands and feet to make sure that every one of the patients we serve, no matter your zip code, should have equity, equity of care. And I'll say to every one of us on this call, if we can just take this information, apply it one conversation at a time, one relationship at a time, I truly believe 
that we all can make a, make a difference in this space. God bless you guys. Thank you for attending our celebration and have a good rest of your day.